Hello, thank you for ev everyone for joining us today. I'm pleased to welcome you all to this humanities seminar, Ancient History Unearthed. My name is Pamela Sweat and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities. Along with my duties as Dean, I'm also his an historian specializing in the cultural and social history of Europe, especially Germany, in the first half of the 20th century. In the Faculty of Humanities, we explore human culture in many different ways. Our faculty, staff, and students can be found in art studios, in experimental laboratories, in archives and libraries, um, and out in the community, uh, in all sorts of community-based activities and research. We have about 115 full-time faculty members in a number of different disciplines and departments, as varied as music cognition and philosophy, communications management and French, and many more. At McMaster, we believe that the humanities has a critical role to play in understanding ourselves and the wider world and in confronting the challenges that we face today. We also believe in lifelong learning and the importance of strengthening the relationships between the university and the community around us. And that's why we hold events like this. I'm thrilled to share tonight the fascinating research of my colleagues in the Department of Greek and Roman Studies uh, who join us for our discussion of um, ancient history unearthed. So let's get started. I'd like to first introduce our panelists. First, we have Dr. Martin Beckman. He received his PhD in classics from McMaster University. He specializes in classical archeology span and iconography, city of Rome, Roman imperial history, and ancient numismatics. He, excavated in, he has excavated in South Italy, Bulgaria, Turkey, Greece, and Jordan. And he's also currently the department chair uh, in Greek and Roman studies. We also have Dr. Spencer Pope. Uh, Dr. Pope is an associate professor in the department of Greek and Roman studies, also at McMaster University. He received a PhD from the Institute for Archaeology and the Ancient World at Brown University in the United States and a BA from Middlebury College in Vermont. He has excavated at numerous archaeological sites in Italy, including Palike, uh, Naxos, and Ustica. We also have um, Adrian Talotti Prestos. You know, Adrian, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask you how exactly uh, to pronounce your last name. You can uh, correct me when, when you take the mic. Um, Adrian is a PhD candidate in the Department of Greek and Roman Studies at McMaster. His PhD research examines connectivity and mobility of an Onotrian <laughs> and other Italic peoples in Southern Italy from the 10th to the 6th centuries BCE. So I will invite each of you to provide further information about your work. Uh, and when we get to Adrian, he can uh, cor correct my uh, poor pronunciations. So Martin, uh, why don't you start us off, please? Okay, great, thanks, Pamela. Um, so would this be for the like the first question or a general intro or? Uh, yeah, if you could just, um, yeah, just a little general introduction about uh, your specialties. Um, yeah, uh, well, I'm uh, I'm an archaeologist. Um, uh, also, I work on uh, uh, Roman uh, numismatics, and uh, I've been uh, involved in various uh, archaeological projects, and most recently this one, together with my uh, colleague, uh, Miles McCallum at uh, St. Mary's. Uh, university in Halifax and we've been working at this uh, for a little while now since uh, since before the pandemic. Sorry I muted myself go ahead Spencer. Our excavation is also a collaboration with St. Mary's University in Halifax and I, I love the symmetry we we have with this we are um, Look a little bit further south in Italy, our fieldwork has centered around the ancient Greek colony of Metaponto and you know, the interaction among indigenous populations and Greek settlers in this region. And maybe it's okay if I expand a little bit on, on this. Uh, so the, the site is located in the instep of the Italian peninsula in modern Basilicata. Metaponto was founded about 630 BCE and in time grew to control more than 400 square kilometers of terrain. We began archaeological fieldwork there in 2017 with the objective of 
better defining the use of the land and to track the distribution of villages, farmsteads, and necropolis within the territory. This led to excavations at a site called Incoronata, which was an, a, a foundation by the indigenous Italic population called the Enotrians. And Incoronata grew in the eighth century and was soon home to an enclave of Greek settlers. And this is a fact recorded in the archeological record through an affluence of Greek imported pottery and Greek style pottery. So it seems that they imported both Greek pots and Greek potters. The site entered a third phase in about the midpoint of the sixth century BC, 550 BC or so, and was reoccupied as a Greek sanctuary dependent upon the city of Metaponto. And with this, it was culturally integrated into that Greek sphere of interest. So our, our research explores both the rural urban divide of the ancient Greek city, as well as urbanization of the indigenous population of Italy and the impact of Greek colonization on their territory and their communities. And we're, we're really lucky to operate at Incornata that does a great job of, of telling the story. Yes, excellent. Okay, great. Adrian. All right, uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Adrian Tolati Proestos, and first I'd like to say I'm honored to be here and uh, to thank everyone for the opportunity to share what we do. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, I'm writing my uh, PhD thesis under the supervision of uh, Dr. Pope. Uh, my thesis is titled uh, Indigenous Networks in Ancient Enotria, which focuses on the uh, indigenous population of uh, southern Italy, which, um, as Spencer said, is, are known as the Enotrians. And what I'm doing is a network analysis that uh, stretches the, the temporal scale and the geographic scale of what we do at Incoronata. So looking at, um, basically, I'm conducting a statistical analysis of, uh, of various sites in southern Italy from the year 1000 to about 600 BC. And that's uh, in collaboration with what uh, we're doing at Incoronata, uh, looking, uh, sort of setting the stage for the interaction between uh, the Greek settlers and the uh, indigenous Italic peoples in Southern Italy. Wonderful. So thank you all. Now, as we enter the main part of our seminar, I invite attendees to have a question for any of the guests to please enter them in the Q and A at any time um, as you're listening to responses. Uh, we'll be gathering these up and we'll try to move to some of the, um, the questions that are submitted uh, in a little bit of time. So while people are working on that, um, my first question actually is um, for you again, Adrian. Could you tell me about uh, the specific archaeological techniques or technologies that you employ during your excavation process? Yeah, of course. Um, so there's a, given that archaeology is a, a is a complex process. Uh, we've involved, there's numerous phases and uh, numerous types of technologies and techniques, both uh, in the lab and in the field that we've uh, employed at, uh, at Incoronata. Um, and we started uh, a number of years ago with a standard battery of um, what we call um, remote sensing. So using um, things like magnetometry and earth resistance surveys, uh, which are basically soil tests which uh, help us to identify um, any structures that might be um, might be under under the earth mm -hmm. um, in incorporation and along with that we also use um, mapping and GIS which is uh, geographic information systems um, so that would involve th using things like uh, drones which have become uh, ubiquitous but nonetheless a very important part of uh, archaeological excavation uh, total stations, um, using special kinds of cameras for photogrammetry to create uh, 3D models of the site, which are very useful when we can't be there, um, can't be there year round. Um, we've also have employed um, in the lab a number of uh, petrographic analysis or um, soil type analyses to, um, which has uh, been in collaboration with uh, a number of uh, Italian colleagues from the University of Sanio and the University of Catania. Um, and what, looking at the, uh, uh, the, the chemical composition of soil uh, on, the, on the site can tell us a lot about, um, about various uh, activities that might've taken place, such as metalworking or cooking. 
uh, that, uh, and other economic activities that might have taken place uh, at Incoronata. Um, in addition to that, we've also um, con uh, conducted uh, faunal analysis or zooarchaeological analysis, which looks at animal bones, again, relating to economic and um, and economic activities and the diets of the of the inhabitants of of the site and of course there's the uh, the bread and butter of the work that we do which is uh, careful stratigraphic excavation which involves the manual removal of of uh, of soil and earth layer by layer uh, which uncovers the archaeological remains uh, that we that we keep in our lab and this is done using a lot of hard work, uh, <laughs> pickaxes, shovels, uh, trowels, buckets, the type of things you usually see archaeologists uh, archaeologists get up to. Mm -hmm. Great. That's uh, very helpful. Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing. That's that's the part that we are all familiar with, right, from movies and such. Cool. Um, OK, so my next question is for both uh, Martin and Spencer. Um, could you tell us a little bit, and, and maybe Martin, you can go first, um, how the newly discovered information from these digs contributes to our understanding of the historical or cultural context? Um, and, and maybe you can also add something about, you know, whether you found, uh, whether your findings sort of align with your initial hypotheses or expectations, or at least how often that happens. Uh, I'm sure it does in some instances and not in others. Uh, and what surprises you've had along the way? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. There's certainly uh, certainly always surprises. I mean, we started off. Um, we're working with a uh, sort of much smaller site than uh, than Spencer is. We've got basically one one structure. It's a big structure. It's located in the in a valley in the uh, the western uh, uh, face of the Apennines, about seventy five kilometers northeast of Rome, and uh, it's uh, basically a massive concrete podium with some uh, rooms in it, um, built onto the north side of this uh, east-west uh, valley, the valley of the Valino River that flows down to to Rieti and eventually to the to the Tiber. Um, and it, uh, this the, the structure obviously is it's visible. It's always been visible, and it was it was called by the locals the the Baths of Titus because the Titus the second Flavian emperor is from the family that they're that's from that area and Vespasian famously supposedly died in a, in a bath a couple of miles down the road so this thing was big this there's water flowing all over the place there are massive huge springs in this area through the uh, through the limestone rock it actually supplies a, a major part of Rome's uh, drinking water is pumped through the mountains um but yeah, we didn't know what this uh, structure was at all. We theorized it was maybe a villa, but there was a strong local opinion it could be a massive bath complex. Uh, so uh, yeah, we were starting from uh, not necessarily a blank slate because we could see a lot of it, but uh, but we were trying to identify what it was and then what did it possibly who did it belong to? Can we possibly figure that out? Um, that's uh, it's asking a lot. Um, We've been able to identify or answer one of those questions, and what that's what it is, and it does look like it was a villa, and probably a combination of, of the sort of a type of Roman countryside villa that's part uh, grand residential site, and also the other half would be basically productive agricultural site. And we found areas that that uh, that uh, have evidence of both, so storage rooms with with broken amphorae and and big big uh, storage jars. And also uh, uh, rooms with uh, with relatively fine mosaic floors and rooms subdivided into sections for storage and for cooking. Uh, we found evidence of of uh, moderately uh, fancy furniture with bronze uh, metal uh, uh, couch fittings. Uh, we found a, a, a pretty impressive apsidal room with a niche in it that might have maybe once held a, a statue, but of, of course all that is gone. Um, the one big thing we're really lacking from the residential area is uh, is really uh, high level decoration like painting or very uh, very fancy flooring or, or wall coverings in marble veneer. We have no evidence of that at all, so it's a bit of a, a mystery as to what what's going on. So we can say it's a villa, but uh, we still have no idea who who owned it. Thank you. That's that's terrific, and, and and that does seem a bit unusual that there wouldn't be any mosaics or paintings left. Is that right? I mean, it seems to it, me that 
we also yeah, it is it is a surprise. I mean, I've worked at sites before that have had um, um, even very ruined sites that were once quite lavishly decorated, and you always find little pieces, at least, yeah. of of, um, of of the remains of those decorations. We have absolutely none of it. We have very really? clear evidence that people were living there. Definitely burned cooking pots, cooking sites, coins, amphorae. People were definitely there, but. Um, no, no high level decoration. It's, oh, a, it's a little bit of a mystery. Yeah. Spencer, do you want to, to add to that question? Yeah, if, if I may uh, mention two macro and one micro level response. On, on the bigger level, excavations at, in Cornata contribute to a more accurate picture of cultural interaction beginning in the 8th century BCE. In Cornata, the Enotrian community was a thriving and successful place. And it's likely you know, because of that success that Greek merchants were attracted to it. And it, the first Greeks to settle there were merchants and artisans you know, plying their wares and you know, participating in the life of the community you know, economically rather than politically. And you know, we'd see them you know, as guests or you know, visitors rather you know, than um, enfranchised citizens. And this you know, reverses some of the earliest thinking about Greek presence in Italy, that uh, Greeks were there for political mo motives and you know, trying to, to take land and you know, set up communities here. You know, the, the operation is still under control of the Enotrian community. The Enotrians had the agency in the, in the relationship. But in Coronata was abandoned around 630 BCE, which is the same moment the city of Metaponto was founded just a few kilometers away. And whether this was a Pacific and orchestrated event or violent and contested is something we're looking into and, and trying to determine. But it, absolutely, it, it's not coincidence that these two events occurred at the same time. And nor is it coincidence that the Metapontines, you know, 70 years later, went back to the site to found a sanctuary. This, you know, two generations plus after its abandonment, it still had memory, it still had significance. And you know, for, uh, for this, you know, became a, an important site for, for the city. It, it's still on the, on the macro level, the territory of Metaponto has been a lead, a case study for the use of territory in the Greek world. The, in an old picture, you know, years ago, the hypothesis was that the plowlands were empty and there was sort of a hub and spoke system where laborers commuted out to the to the farmlands in the morning, you know, from living in the city center, went out by foot or by donkey, but you know, essentially abandoned it when they weren't working there. You know, the picture has now changed. And our team has you know, made a modest contribution demonstrating that the countryside was full of vibrant life and had permanent settlements, villages, we could even call them suburbs, you know, that, that filled the territory. Uh, another McMaster PhD student, Christine Davidson, is presently exploring connectivity in the territory and has even produced a model that identifies districts or neighborhoods connected to one another in the Greek countryside. The, the macro level, Sorry, the micro level response is that uh, when we began excavations at Incornata, we thought we were gonna get a temple. We did a magnetometry survey and it revealed a rectangular structure about the size and shape common among the sacred Greek buildings, uh, but we were wrong. Instead, our excavations brought us to an Enotrian house consisted of a, of a basement cut out, sort of a, um, um, it had about a one meter deep basement to the space and, and a structure that would have been completed with elevation and perishable materials. Greek and Enotrian pottery indicate a seventh century BCE date and the domestic ware inside likely indicates that this was a domestic unit and uh, this, you know, a, a residence for that Enotrian community. So the, the, the sanctuary remains elusive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So before I move to the next question, I have uh, just out of my own ignorance, I'm a 20th century historian. So um, my process is a different one. Could you tell me how do you actually get these digs, right? So do they have to ask you, do you, uh, do you know that they exist? And so you apply to, to be an excavator of their sites? Like how does that part of it work? Anybody wants to answer that, I'm, I'm curious. 
may I jump in on that? Sure, go ahead. Yes, it's a, it's a, a very serious process. A permission is obtained through the local branch of the Italian Ministry of Culture, actually at the, both the local and, and federal level, and an application is made. And you know, there the, the local authorities are ensuring that the expertise and you know, the, the financial backing is, is appropriate for the undertaking, that it's viable and you know, likely pr to produce successful results. And you know, with that, there's an obligation on our part to adhere to you know, regulations, uh, you know, guidelines for the, from the, the Ministry of Culture. And uh, you know, for our operation, you know, we are uh, grateful to the superintendency of archaeology, the fine arts, and landscapes of Basilicata, who you know, have given the concession you know, for the work and you know, with this entrusted us with an important site. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so my next question is, you know, obviously these digs are large and they take a long time, right? This is a very laborious project, uh, as I think Adrian already uh, alluded to. So, you know, over the years, what impact uh, do these projects have on on your own work, but but also on the sort of the discipline at in in Toto and and on the communities actually in which these uh, sites exist. Uh, maybe Martin, you want to take that one first again? Sure. Um, yeah. Well, it's a it's a project that type of project that evolves over over the years. Sometimes you, you don't know exactly um, what direction it's going to to go or where it's going to take you. Um, but uh, I mean, for me, I think the most interesting and and uh, yeah, positive part of the the whole experience is. It's actually the student experience, and we, I've had so we've had uh, so Miles and I two uh, students start out as uh, undergrads who uh, you know became really dedicated to the project. Um, two of them then um, went on to uh, to do a master's degree uh, here at Mac and studied various uh, aspects of the site. One one student studied a deposit of a uh, really interesting deposit. It looked like. Well, I mean, well, as, as much archaeology often looks like uh, a, a layer of, of trash, ancient trash, and uh, it was um, spread out over the, in, in a sort of a level layer at the very bottom of a, of a room we were excavating and we came down on it quite suddenly and full of top broken tile and brick and amphora. And so we excavated that carefully and we also found coins in there and lots and lots of pottery. And at the first glance, it just seemed like maybe just some evidence of, of uh, yeah, like trash had been dumped there to fill up the floor and then they would level it off. But uh, but um, uh, this this uh, the student Robin um, was able to to study this material and actually reconstruct from it basically where it must have come from because our site's so isolated. We had things like amphorae and uh, very very fancy red slip dining ware and also these coins that ended up all in this deposit. And it could only really have come from probably some area of. Of settlement, but there is no settlement right there. So presumably, it's uh, debris from the the actual builders who were living on site, mm -hmm. and then uh, when they needed to level an area to put a new floor in, they took a big pile of their garbage, which also <laughs> included a few of the coins they lost, put it in there, and then used it as a as a construction material. So I I think you know as a to see a student develop those sorts of uh, ideas over time is. Uh, is a yeah, it's a really great, uh, really great thing, and I'm happy to be able to. We're happy to be able to give people this kind of uh, opportunity. For sure, and and I want Adrian to speak to that in, in just a second. But maybe first, Spencer, do you have anything you want to add on that question? Oh, I'm really echoing what uh, Martin just said. The, the 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 teamwork is really one of the the wonderful aspects and the, the privileges of you know this type of research and you know humanities isn't always associated with group projects, but, you know, for the excavation teamwork is the key. And the, you know, the, our excavation is a partnership with St. Mary's University in Halifax. The other co-director, Dr. Zveva Zavelli, is a faculty member there, and we have students both from MAC and SMU participating in the excavation. The participants, you know, include a core from our own Department of Greek and Roman Studies, uh, including Adrian, 
I mentioned Christine Davidson and Eric Del Fabro is presently uh, looking at black glaze material from the archaeological survey around Metaponto for his PhD thesis. And he's presently in Athens. So we're all terribly jealous of him. Wow. And we have partnerships you know, within Italy. We're grateful to the authorities that permit us to do the work and for the, the warm welcome we've received from the, the town in which Incoronata is located, uh, Pistici, Italy. Uh, and being there is a, is a privilege. We aim to promote cultural, cultural exchange with our presence there. Hopefully we act as good ambassadors for McMaster and for Canada and contribute to those local communities in Pacific Ata. Mm -hmm. So um, thanks, Spencer. And, and so now I do want to turn it over to Adrian. Um, and maybe you could, uh, yeah, just tell us about how that experience has been for you and in where it fits into your overall, um, your, your overall education at McMaster. And, um, and if you might say a little bit about the image behind you while you're at it. Uh, of course. Um, so the image behind me is, um, I look behind me as if it's there. Um, the image behind me is a, an aerial photograph of uh, the site. Um, it's take it was it's from the internet, but uh, it's taken taken a, a few years before uh, <clears throat> before we showed up at the site and started digging there. But um, in Coronado does have uh, quite a long legacy um, as a, a rather important site. Uh, there have been numerous projects over the last several decades. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's wonderful to as a uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it's wonderful as a student to be a part of that legacy, to be a part of that uh, continuing iterative iterative process as archaeology is. Um, uh, what archaeologists knew in this uh, in the seventies are not the same questions we're asking uh, of the site and of the material now. Um, but for myself, I really enjoy just being part of uh, an excavation. I enjoy very much the, the, the physical, practical aspect of it. Um, it's lovely having the Italian landscape as, as one's office to go to every morning. Um, and I, I, and I, as Spencer said, it's, you know, it's lovely to work with such a, a great team. Um, and in but in terms of uh, my research, it, uh, I learn how to be an archaeologist. Um, how to you can only really learn archaeology and the, how to conduct it properly by uh, by doing it um, and being uh, getting to be a steward of uh, of cultural heritage uh, is the raison d'etre for archaeologists. So um, yeah, you can only do that by being on uh, part of a project like this. Um, you know, and in terms of my uh, my thesis, it it. Uh, it's ra rather nice to be to be able to excavate at uh, at a site that uh, will probably be a an example that I'll be using in my um, uh, in my data set. So yeah. where my I look I my project focuses on the larger bigger scale. It's nice to be able to see things at a at a much at a much finer scale. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Okay. So now maybe um, everybody could take a turn um, just sort of telling us about, you know, we're, we're coming up to the summer. So um, perhaps you're all heading back there soon, hopefully for, for your sakes. Um, so what are your future plans? What are your next steps on, on the various projects that you've got underway? Uh, Martin? Yeah, thanks. So uh... Yeah, we've got uh, we've got plans to uh, to head back in the uh, in the middle of May, and we're going to spend uh, five more weeks um, with the students uh, working. And this time uh, uh, last year, we worked uh, on a central area of the terrace. I, I think I didn't mention how how big this thing is. It's a it's a sixty meter wide and about twenty meter deep concrete terrace. That's just the surface uh, measurements at the top, and it's uh, supported on uh, uh, yeah, basically a system of pillars and walls that, that come up probably 20 meters um, at, the, at their highest from the uh, hillside. So um, a lot of the upper front portion has been uh, heavily damaged and probably part of it had uh, artificial wooden floors. So they've collapsed. Um, so last year we worked in one of the lower rooms in the uh, in the podium itself, and that's where we found evidence of agricultural work. 
Um, and also uh, at the very top at the back part, um, the rear part of the, the structure and where we uh, uncovered uh, uh, the rest of the apsidal room and a small room beside it that had some evidence of furniture in it. So this year, the plan is to extend our work further towards the, uh, towards the west and hopefully we will uh, uncover some more rooms in the area that seems to be uh, a residential area. And uh, no, no work has been done there before, so we're quite, uh, quite excited to see what, uh, what we might uncover. So Martin, in a, in a five week span that you're there, would it be just you and your team or are there other international teams of you know, working simultaneously, but in maybe different areas of the site? Well, yeah, the, the team is, uh, so half of it is uh, from um, from McMaster and the other half. And, and uh, I think we have even got a couple more returning students from St. Mary's who are coming with, uh, with my colleague, uh, Miles. And uh, we work basically uh, together on uh, last year in two different areas of the site, but this year probably will be will be all of us uh, working in, in one area on the, mm -hmm. uh, on the mm -hmm. upper. But there aren't yeah. also archeologists from, you know, the Netherlands and, and other. Well, other we do, areas. yeah, we do. I mean, we don't have any teams from the full teams of uh, people from elsewhere. We have some people from, from elsewhere in Canada and right. uh, we have uh, uh, our, our uh, uh, paleobotanist uh, uh, Katie from from the UK who comes down we, uh -huh. we have uh, uh, an expert in uh, in soil coring uh, coring of, uh, of uh, uh, aquatic environments who who did some work for us a few years before and he'll be coming back to uh, to take a couple more cores in this karstic lake we have at the bottom of the uh, uh -huh. of the valley right by the the Roman road the, the via Solaria so we're hoping we got some good results uh, data um, um, back to the back to the Middle Ages, so we're hoping mm. to uh, get some information about what was growing and um, there in that area. Maybe if we can get the right depth of cores, maybe down to, to the period where our villa was actually uh, occupied. Which I guess I should mention to us in the first century uh, CE is where uh, most of our uh, material is coming from. Okay, great. Okay, Spencer, what about you this summer? What have you got on the docket? Yeah, so we have spent most of our time at the site to date looking at this Anotrian house, and we've got close to seeing all of it. Last year, we got what we think is the floor with a pottery more or less in situ and even found post holes. And with this, you know, we begin to... to um, transition to a phase of, of considering the, the reconstruction. And I mean, if, imagine a, a timber frame, probably reeds move, placed horizontally to create the walls and then covered with a, a thin coat of, of clay, you know, acting like a, like a plaster to, to make it a little bit weatherproof. Uh, we have some unfinished business in the area immediately adjacent to the, the house. There are some pits you know, that include evidence of burning. And we hypothesize that there may even, you know, be a kiln and with a sort of a, a area of production that, you know, maybe an annex to sort of a backyard to the house and, you know, related to the functioning of the house. And, you know, this is our, you know, our primary objective, you know, with this you know, sort of looking at, you know, not just a house, but imagine like a plot you know, we, we can begin to consider things like density of the settlement and, you know, uh, how it, houses may or may not have aligned with others. In the big picture, we hope at one point to have an exhibition of material from the site here at Big Master. And we're working on a, a digital virtual reconstruction of the site. So everything, you know, brings, uh, you know, our knowledge or, you know, our results to a wider audience. And beyond that, there's a big set of publications to prepare. Mm -hmm. And so we're all uh, very busy with uh, you know, the next steps and you know, going forward, including uh, in, in publication for the site. And I know uh, theses uh, like Adrian, who's you know, working on it uh, you know, quite rigorously. Right, yeah, for sure. And Adrian, where are you uh, on that? Can you tell us a little bit about what you have plans uh, to get done over the next few months? Uh, hopefully, yeah, get to 
participate in the dig and uh, okay. hopefully find more. We, we don't know what we're going to find. So that, that's always right. the adventure. And, uh, mm -hmm. and in terms of things that I want to look at at the site are some um, some pottery pieces that I came across last year that might have uh, come from further afield than than uh, uh, than we might have expected. And so I'm hoping to take a closer look at that and obviously um, finish excavating those pits that uh, Spencer mentioned. Right, right. So can I ask, Adrian, maybe you can answer this. So when you go in there and you find, um, you know, pottery, uh, Martin mentioned coins, other, you know, all sorts of daily use items and, and such. So does, after you clean them off and I, I'm sure everything needs to be labeled and tracked and everything, and then where does it go? Is there a storage site near the, the site or does it go back to Rome or what, what do you do with these items as you're, as you're unearthing them and cataloging them? Uh, yeah, we we have a, a a storage facility, a warehouse in uh, yeah near the town of near Incoronata in the town of Metaponto, mm -hmm. uh, which is also happens to be our our lab facility and things are okay. stored there. Right. Okay, I see. All right, good. Okay, so I have plenty of my own questions, but um, I'm seeing the um, Q and A populating lots of of questions in my uh, chat here, so I want to get to some of those. So these are from the audience. Um, and it's hard to know where to begin, but I think I'm going to begin with one that sort of picks up on something that, um, that I asked about. So, uh, which was around how the digs get authorized. Um, so, and this crossed my mind as well. So one of the audience members writes, so how do you become aware of the potential sites? Is it related to, you know, the, what you what you've already learned about these this region or you know through contacts either in the government or other um other archaeologists so so how do you get connected to a specific site before you then ask for the for the permission to use it um i see spencer you're off yeah. mute so why don't you take that one may i jump in yeah this is a really great inquiry and i think you know we could say they're scientific and um less scientific methods uh, it, the less scientific may be, you know, local knowledge and individuals that, you know, uh, even, you know, for years, maybe even generations passed over the terrain and noticed, you know, pottery or intricately cut blocks. And, you know, with this, uh, you know, indicate there's a, a site worthy of, you know, an exploration and, you know, any number of sites became archeological excavations in this way. We, we have a lot of tools for a more scientific approach, including the remote sensing that that um, Adrian mentioned, you know, that um, either you know, from a distance, you know, great or small distance may indicate anomalies under the earth that, you know, could potentially indicate, uh, you know, archeological finds. Our work for surface survey sort of mixes the two. And, you know, we, we spent uh, a few summers just walking through fields and picking, you know, noting whether concentrations of finds and picking them up, and you know, with this, um, analyzing them for for type and for date, and where there's a lot of them, and and maybe you know some you know, uh, significant pottery, we suspect there may be a site nearby under the ground, and with that, we you know we could begin remote sensing. But it, it, I think you know, for Incornata, the site was known locally before it was known archaeologically, and and I think you know, the, the you know, majority of sites, uh, you know, in the, in the region uh, are are known in this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question from an audience member is around climate change. Right, we're certainly seeing climate change impact the. Um, you know, the terrain everywhere we go in our own lives here in Canada and elsewhere. And uh, this uh, audience member writes, you know, how has it affected the work that you do? Are, are you seeing changes uh, in the countryside and in, in the site where you study? Um, yes, anything anything on that climate change and archaeology. Uh, Martin, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, um, I don't have anything specific to to our our site but um there have been some interesting developments in recent uh recent years uh, regarding uh study of climate change and uh, the development and and uh, even the, the the fall of the of the roman empire there, there have been studies of 
for example, the temperature levels of the uh, of the Mediterranean, as uh, um, from the evidence of little micro micro fossil shells that are deposited in the sediment, that seem to suggest that there is a after a warming in the Republican period, there's a cooling in the Imperial period, and that's now more recently been backed up by by studies from uh, from swamps in in central central Europe, where they've uh, through coring again have, have uh, discovered evidence of. Uh, cooler, cooler weather in the third century CE, which may have uh, precipitated the 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 uh, so-called barbarian invasions, or maybe better described migrations of peoples from the from the east into the territory of the of the Roman Empire. Our site ends before all of this uh, this sort of activity uh, got going, though. But maybe who knows? Maybe we will find some evidence of that if our own coring in the lake uh, below our site uh, mm. down to the right levels. Mm -hmm. Has it impacted the the work? I mean, you know, I've been to Italy a couple of times in in the the depths of the summer, and I I can imagine it must be pretty challenging to work outdoors under some of the you know, recent temperatures that we've seen um, in Europe lately. Are you trying to adjust for that? Do you go out very early in the morning and then knock off at 11 a.m.? Or how, how does that work? Uh, Adrian? Yeah, well, I like the heat, so I, I, it never bothers me. Oh, well, you picked the right, you picked the right uh, <laughs> career then. Exactly. Um, now, obviously, you know, talking about high temperature safety is is paramount, and we always ensure that on site. So lots of water we bring up, and yeah, we we start you know quite early days, getting up at uh, you know break of day. We tried to excavate in not in July and August if it can be avoided, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, it is a challenge. Um, but in terms of uh, climate change, is something I, uh, I we can say is that. Um, uh, sometimes uh, climate change can actually help. So in the case of uh, drought, we can um, we can see crop marks, crops that would otherwise have covered up uh, the outlines of uh, of archaeological sites. Um, sometimes archaeology be, can become visible, but yeah. uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, as on our side, we actually have uh, a case of erosion. So if we have lots of rain, lots of warm temperatures. Um, the, the the hill where we're excavating uh, can actually we actually can lose some of the archaeology so it's a it's a situation it depends on the situation but it, it is a problem that archaeologists are facing everywhere yeah yeah no I can imagine um and you know you were just talking about erosion and and that sort of um points me to one of the questions from an audience member could you explain a little bit about how these sites get buried over time you know who wants to take that one? Can I go again? Sure. Yeah. I think you know, one thing we have to consider that there we we can only dig what is still left, and just through natural processes, there be depositions of soil that you know get blown in or you know get uh, you know eroded in mm -hmm. that uh, you know cover the site and. If, with this, you know, the extant remains are a small set of what had been there. There are any number of sites that got pillaged or, um, you know, they got built over, you know, by a, a you know, a modern city and, you know, uh, archaeological levels got, you know, destroyed in the process. So, and it, 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 if it's a puzzle, you know, we have nowhere close to all of the pieces and you know often don't have the picture on the box but you know through careful work we can reconstruct what was there with respect to the communities in which these sites sit so how much is interest is there from you know local community members do you ever run into challenges with them that where they'd rather you not disturb the site or that they've got their own conceptions of what it was used for. I mean, Martin, you mentioned how, you know, they had they had thought of this as a baths, right? So then is there pushback sometimes with local communities or or any, yeah, just anything about that relationship between these, you know, researchers from far away and and then, you know, the local stories around these sites or a sense of propriety or anything? Well, uh, 
speaking for our, our side, I mean, there may be one or two locals that will never convince that it's not still not a bath, even if yeah. we have a small yeah. excavated, but, but uh, everyone it seems uh, extremely excited mm -hmm. that the people are, the people are, are there and um, interested in it and uh, coming to, to do some work. And we have a, sort of a, an open day at the end of the of the season every year and we get uh, 70 80 90 people coming through to and then the mayor will come up sometimes and uh, the people will visit us throughout the throughout the campaign and uh, yeah it's I, I think in our experience anyways it's been uh, uh, it's been nothing but uh, nothing but positive. The only, I mean, they've invested and locals have been, then invested more uh, more into the site, uh, installing signs, mm -hmm. fixing up the roads, fixing up the access, and uh, yeah, the only the only bit of a downside there is that every year to you know, at the end of the season to protect the site, we have to cover it all up. So we will we will restore conserve the uh, the architecture and fix the cracks and whatnot but then the whole thing what we've just dug up then gets uh, covered with uh, textile and uh, uh, soil again it's the best way to protect it and uh, that's one of the biggest challenges to uh, uh, I think uh, maybe in our in our relationship with the locals is that they would want to see it ex mm -hmm. left exposed so that they can um, appreciate it year round but uh, yeah. to conserve something like that would would uh would really it's just beyond everybody's uh, means mm -hmm. yeah uh can i ask all three of you maybe to to tell me and it doesn't have to be something recent it could be years ago for, for the two of you have been doing this for a long time but what was this sort of um, you know, I can think of as a historian, a few key documents that I came across at one point or another that just, you know, really blew my mind. And I can still remember, you know, opening up the file and seeing them. So, you know, has there been a, a, a moment in which you unearthed something that you were just, uh, you know, took your breath away? Uh, Spencer, you want to take that one yeah. first? Do you have something in mind? Oh, at in Coronata, it finding a Greek pottery like a Corinthian amphora, a, a transport jar that would brought wine in from Greece, you know, sometime before, you know, seven hundred BCE or, or you know, in the seventh century, uh, you know, it's pretty stunning, and I think it it really makes immediate the the lifeways and even you know the the trade networks that they're on. And you know, with this, it's not the most, let's say, aesthetically advanced piece of pottery, but you know, it, it tells quite a story. The Anotrian pottery is is also you know quite beautiful and you know of, of you know significant artistic value. And you know, finding a small fragment is you know is always a thrill. Uh, and in the last uh, last year, we came across a, a very special find, uh, a a tortoise shell. We named the tortoise Mortimer, and it seems uh, the the entire uh, shell was you know was dumped in uh, essentially a, a uh, waste pit. It seems Mortimer may have been somebody's dinner. Oh, <laughs> poor Mortimer. <laughs> uh, Martin, do you have something at some point that took your breath away? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there have been a couple of things we've had. Uh, I, I remember even uh, even just uh, um, last year, so two summers ago, we had found a, a glass bead, a multicolored glass bead on our site mm -hmm. that was uh, um, sort of a white and, and blue core with uh, little um, yellow decorative blobs of glass on it, which was we were impressed by. But uh, then later that year, when I was back here preparing a a lecture for a Roman archaeology course and reading about finds from the, the Roman fort at Newstead, which is like in Britain, past Hadrian's Wall, north of Hadrian's Wall. Um, I opened the plates and there was that exact same bead. Wow. It was just, uh, just that uh, sense of, of connection um, in, in these vastly different areas of the, of the Roman world was, was pretty, uh, was pretty mm -hmm. impressive. Yeah, for sure. What about you, Adrian? Uh, it's hard to pick. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard. 
because I like I love the process so much. It's hard to to raise a single artifact above all the others. But uh, I guess two lately that came up uh, at Incoronata. Uh, last year we came across an area that we are fairly sure was involved uh, in cooking, and it was just um, sort of a highly compacted, slightly baked earth with a cooking pot found next to it. So that was rather indicative. And another one that we found were some, uh, uh, I think it was in the same rescue spit as uh, Sp that Spencer, Spencer mentioned that where we found the, um, where we found the tortoise shell, which was a bowl with, um, with, uh, with, with what I think were grape seeds wow. um, in it. So uh, wow. yeah, num I guess my favorite things have to do with food, but uh, <laughs> Well, you're a graduate student after all, so. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, that that's great. There was a, another question I wanted to get to because I, I think maybe some of our listeners will will be surprised to hear this. And that is um, this uh, audience member writes um, that they're aware that um, the nuclear reactor at McMaster, we have our own campus nuclear reactor, has been involved in, in some of this research. Um, I think. I think uh, maybe around the coins, but I'm not sure. So um, could somebody um, give us a little insight into that process? Again, may I start? We, sure. within In a collaboration between the nuclear reactor and you know, the, the personnel of the reactor and the McMaster Museum of Art, we undertook compositional analyses of the coins and you know basically you know studies that would indicate the elements used and the percentage of the element found in the coin. So we can see the, the purity of silver or things like uh, junk metal put into bronze coins, you know, in addition to the copper and tin. And you know, with this it opens up a, a a whole new avenue for exploring the material, not just uh, you know the artistic or economic, but uh, you know, getting to the the core of the material itself, and even you know, questioning whether there might be some deliberate uh, you know, devaluing of the coins, adding junk metals to make the supply go further. It, 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 this is one of the wonderful things about you know, working at McMaster that these resources are all in house, yeah. and we. Uh, we do not have any coins from in Coronata, but uh, we be interested in, in looking at other materials from the site and for compositional analyses. The, in, we would require permission to, to take the material out of Italy. So it's a, a little bit of a, you know, extended process. And we want to make sure that we get, you know, the, the examples that would have the greatest impact before right. you know, committing or before approaching the reactor on, uh, you know, potential further collaboration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I'm getting a uh, word from uh, our, our support staff here that we need to move to a final question. So this will be our last question tonight. Um, and it comes again from an audience member who writes, um, can you discuss any notable misconceptions or myths about archeology span that you encounter free frequently and how you address them in your work? Martin, do you wanna start us off on this last one? Um, sometimes I'm asked about certain dinosaurs, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, although the Romans were aware of, uh, the, well, they, they were aware of the, some parts of the evidence for the existence of dinosaurs, um, mm -hmm. like bones, but, uh, it'd be pretty neat to find one of those on, uh, one of our sites, but we mm -hmm. haven't, uh, we haven't done so yet. Um, I, uh, aside from that, um, I, I can't think of uh, I can't think of too of too much that we encounter in our in our work. Uh, maybe maybe questions about well, are you are you looking for are you looking for money? Are you looking for gold? That's that's fairly that's fairly frequent. But uh, yeah, yeah, I even get that sometimes. Um, uh, people have asked me and actually news outlets have asked me about, you know, hidden Nazi gold since I work on uh, the thirties and forties in Germany. So, um, but it's not something I have ever pursued. Uh, Adrian, what about you? Have you ever come across, do you have family members maybe who have misconceptions about your work or other um, folks? 
more just to add to the misconception um yeah. it's something you asked about pamela uh, earlier about where we keep the artifacts um, uh -huh. so the artifacts are as i understand it legally property of uh, the italian state in our case uh, we as archaeologists don't um don't sell them we don't own them uh, right. we don't profit off uh, excavating for them um and that's the misconception, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and that's a, a, a more dangerous misconception uh, because mm -hmm. looting does and can occur on, mm -hmm. on sites and um, mm -hmm. disrupt the integrity of the of the, uh, of any site. Sure. Yeah, I guess, and that would obviously be another reason then that they're covered up, you know, over the winter months. And have you ever had one of the sites um, get disturbed while you weren't there? Uh, in I, in Coronato, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I have been at other sites, uh, uh -huh. also in Italy, uh, further north, uh, closer to where, um, Dr. Beckman digs, uh, mm -hmm. where where there has we've gone That's... we've gone home for the night and come back the next morning and found a big hole and oh, we don't wow. know what they took, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it does happen. Yeah, well, that's terrible. And Spencer. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll echo what the, the colleagues have said. Uh, it, it, maybe w one of the things to be aware of too is that you know, excavation is four or five weeks out of the year. And you know, our work in the classroom, our work uh, in, in a library you know, occupies the other 11 right. or so months. And you know, that, you know, the, you know, the excavation is just the beginning of the process. There's uh -huh. a lot of studying of the material that you know, can be years after the you know after they're excavated and you know careful analyses identification based on you know comparable material excavated such as the, the beat Dr. Beckman just mentioned and you know with this it's it is a long process the you know the the uh, more conspicuous part is the excavation but you know the entire job is is much right. broader yeah less fun right <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, um, and, and with that, um, we'll wrap up this webinar. I'd like to thank Martin, Spencer, and Adrian for their time with us. It was fascinating to hear about the research they're all doing. I've heard about these digs. Uh, I certainly know that they're happening, but um, this was the most uh, sort of detail I've gotten, and, and I certainly appreciate it, and I'm sure our audience did as well. Uh, a reminder to everyone to share their thoughts about um, the seminar in the survey. Uh, it will be in your inbox uh, tomorrow morning, so uh, please do fill it out, and, and, and we certainly uh, read that carefully and, and try to integrate the uh, feedback. The Alumni Engagement Office and Faculty of Humanities has lots of other events like this with other faculty members and alumni and students, uh, so be sure to keep an eye on our websites um, and I'll the chat. Uh, I believe the link has been sent. So thank you for attending everyone. Uh, it was an enjoyable hour and best of luck. Bye-bye.